I think we're all set. Thank you, Ms. Jane. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Our topic today is um, Mamantine for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, there have been a handful of questions that have popped up about ADHD in a couple different realms. Um, so this was one, one of the uh, topics that was requested. Um, we did offer something similar. I was able to update this a little bit. Um, about a month ago with our SE console echo, um, but I was able to, to track down a smidge more information. Um, there's not a whole lot, but um, I was able to track down a couple more things for this one. Objective wise, we're gonna discuss the mechanism of action. So why are we even looking at Mementine? Um, how might the actions of Mementine be useful for the treatment of ADHD? Um, and then we'll take a look at the evidence. That's where we're going to spend most of the time. So Nemenda, Nemenda XR, um, Mementine's formal indication is for the treatment of moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. Um, it has been used off-label for various different dementias, um, those associated with Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's, as well as vascular dementia. Um, we've seen Mementine use both on its own, as well as in combination with other acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. I wanted to point that out because um, we're gonna be looking at um, Mementine's use alone and in combination with some of our stimulant medications as well. Um, so solo versus combination seems to be a, a theme for this medication. Dosing wise, um, the trials that I was able to find are all immediate release. Um, so just from an orientation standpoint, um, we can start at five milligrams. Titration is usually weekly up to a maximum of 20 milligrams daily for the immediate release. Most of the trials that we're looking at really played within that range, looking at both 10 and 20 milligrams daily. So seeing that we really were using it somewhere else, how did we even have memantine enter the discussion for ADHD? Um, so memantine's a glutamate receptor antagonist. So it's an N-methyl D-aspartate, so the NMDA glutamate receptor. Just as a reminder, our NMDA receptor is one of the glutamate receptors that requires a few different things to occur. Um, so glutamate has to bind, and it has its binding site here. Um, I'm gonna scooch our faces over to the other side here. Glycine has to bind um, to the receptor. So both of them are bound, but magnesium sits in the middle. So this is an um, ion channel. Magnesium sits in the middle and kind of blocks things up. So even if glutamate and glycine are bound, we may not get a whole lot of action. So we need at least partial depolarization. Um, so the neuron needs to be trending toward um, having a depolarization, and then the magnesium gets kicked out. Once that magnesium is kicked out, we can have both sodium and calcium enter into the neuron, and that may further depolarize the neuron, causing um, additional action potential and actions down, down the way. So we're looking at blocking the actions of this particular uh, receptor. It doesn't just do that. Um, there are some reports, especially in animal models, um, that memantine also works on <laughs> the dopamine and serotonin reuptake pumps. Um, so trying to increase the amount of dopamine and norepinephrine or dopamine and serotonin um, that are around. It appears to have some action on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And this is where some of the linkages started to happen. Um, in dementia patients, they've been looking at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors specifically because it, of its links to learning and memory. They were hoping to be able to optimize actions at these acetylcholine receptors to further improve overall cognitive performance for dementia patients. But since those receptors don't do just one thing, they did see improvement in cognition and learning. There was a thought that maybe this could be somewhat neuroprotective and it began to 
move, as many of the medications do, um, into being explored in a variety of other areas. Things like um, epileptic um, encephalopathy, they were looking at it for treatment of autism spectrum disorder, and then they started looking at it for cognition in patients who had psychosis, and then cognition for patients with ADHD. So that's one of the reasons why they started to move it in that direction. Memantine also has some action on our serotonin receptors, and it does modulate activity in the prefrontal cortex. Now, this doesn't describe all of the reasons why this may work. Um, that nicotinic acetylcholine re receptor activity isn't the primary driver, so why might the glutamate action play a role? Well, ADHD is one of our more common neurodevelopmental disorders. We see two different pockets of symptoms, so inattentive symptoms and hyperactive impulsive symptoms. Those symptoms are thought to be associated with changes in the prefrontal cortex. Most of our treatments up to this point, if you think of the stimulants, if you think of our alpha agonists, if you think of the norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, things like atomoxetine, we really focused on dopamine and norepinephrine. There's been additional modeling done that does show in some patients with ADHD, they have elevated glutamate levels. Once they're treated and those inattentive or hyperactive symptoms are under control, we can see um, they've measured a reduction in glutamate. So the thought is maybe too much glutamatergic activity is contributing to some part of the development um, in symptom, symptoms of ADHD. Now, what might those look like? We're gonna look at a lot of rating scales um, and there are a handful of what they call executive functioning deficits um, so the whole goal is to make patients who have ADHD, we're all inattentive sometimes, uh, we all can be hyperactive, we might be impulsive sometimes, but it doesn't usually interfere with our ability to get our responsibilities done. So this is looking at um, symptoms in these different areas that really start to impair an individual's ability to take care of things at home, at work, at school. These would be things like initiating. So being able to plan out a task or responsibility or project assignment, things that are being asked of the individual. So are they able to figure out what they need to do um, and initiate that whole process uh, to make sure things get done? Inhibition of thoughts and feelings. So are they able to really focus on what they need to be focusing on um, and not necessarily anything that may come to mind or catch their attention at the time? Organizing, are they able to categorize and organize the information so they can, again, take care of what they need to get taken care of? Can they do that planning process, recognizing, um, I'm working through this with my son who is 16, as you're planning for, um, yesterday was his last day of school. I am here at work. Uh, he has soccer, open fields, as well as basketball practice. So backing things up, if you need to be at the school at this time, um, how much time does it take you to get there? How much time does it take you to get ready? So what time are you gonna need to get up? Um, so all of the different considerations that may have to go into a planning process. And then self-monitoring, are you able to do kind of some of that check-in to see where things might be going awry to get yourself back on task? And those may be areas that folks with ADHD really struggle with. And they struggle with it, I would imagine most of us struggle in one or more of those areas from time to time, but across the board, these tend to be deficits that then hinder their ability to really accomplish what they're capable of accomplishing. So maybe glutamate plays a role in ADHD. That's what they're hoping. Um, and because the adverse effects of um, memantine don't tend to be incredibly problematic, um, some gastrointestinal effects, um, sometimes there can be some drowsiness or insomnia, sometimes there can be headache, but there really doesn't tend to be significant toxicity that we're concerned about. So it appears safe, so might we get some benefit looking at this um, for a new, a new treatment indication? I started with adults um, because that was where some of the evidence 
initiated, and then we'll move into the, the data related to pediatric patients. So there's not a lot. Um, so there's less than um, 50 trials, case reports, case series that are out there on the use of memantine for ADHD. So there is not a lot of information. I started with a pilot trial. So this was a pilot trial that was done, a handful of patients, so 28 patients that were all adults that had ADHD. Um, these individuals were between the ages of 18 and 55. The average age was 41. Um, they had been on a handful of other medications um, and they were being treated on an outpatient basis. They were um, enrolled in this pilot trial. So it open label, they knew what they were getting into and they were given um, memantine and they could increase the dose up to 20 milligrams and they wanted to follow them for 12 weeks. Um, our stimulants work pretty quickly. We can see improvement in symptoms within just hours. Our alpha agonists tend to work fairly quickly. We can see improvement in symptoms within a couple days. Um, for other agents, things like the norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, it does take some time. So they really wanted that 12 weeks just in case the memantine's effects were delayed like something like the atomoxetine. Their specific uh, outcomes are um, rating scale outcomes. So they looked at the adult ADHD investigator symptom report. This was a newer one for me. I will refer back to my notes. So it's an 18 item scale and it uses the nine symptoms of inattention and hyperactive impulsive symptoms. Um, so that's what it was based off of. And it was rated from zero to three. Zero meaning no symptoms, three meaning the symptoms were severe. And then the clinical global impression. What they found was patients who were given um, the uh, memantine, most of them were able to get up to the 20 milligrams. There were a couple who could only tolerate up to 15 milligrams. The patients had moderate ADHD symptoms. Um, so their average score was about a 30 at baseline. And what they found after those 12 weeks was a significant improvement in that adult ADHD investigator symptom report scale. So it dropped by about 18 points. Um, that would lead to an average total score of about 12, meaning that quite a few of those symptoms were gone. And that's reflected by about a 44% 44 per, 44 of the participants had a much or very much improved rating on the CGI scale. So they really saw a robust response in quite a few of those individuals. When they looked at um, the inattentive scale, they saw a bigger um, numerical reduction for the inattentive symptoms than they did for the hyperactive impulsive symptoms. So the thought was, hey, there is something here, their symptoms improved. Um, overall, it was fairly well tolerated. Let's look at this in a more robust fashion. So this one said, yes, yes, it looks like this is going to be an improvement. We start to move into more of our randomized controlled trials. So this was a 12 week double blind placebo controlled trial. So let's standardize this. Let's look at what is um, actually the difference that we see. Again, it was done in adult patients. They were um, diagnosed with ADHD, but they were able to remain on their ADHD treatment. So they had to be on a stable dose of a stimulant. All of them, um, except for one, were on methylphenidate. The other was on a, a mixed amphetamine salt. And they did not give us what their baseline um, stimulant dose was, but it could not have changed over the, the course of the last month. So they were able to be on it, but hopefully the improvement in it um, was kind of stable and out of their system, and they still qualified for the trial even on the stimulant dose. Again, it was a relatively small number of patients, only 26. They were on memantine. They could increase the dose up to 20 milligrams. When they did this, so they used that same scale, that adult ADHD investigator symptom scale, and then they also used something called the behavior rating inventory of executive functions. Um, so this evaluates a number of those executive functions, that list that I showed you before. When they looked at these two, there was no difference between the placebo and the memantine group. Um, so they did see improvement from baseline to endpoint, 
but it was the same in both of the groups. So it wasn't shown that the memantine was, was beneficial. They weren't real satisfied with that. So they wanted to look at a, a subgroup analysis. Um, so are they able to see differences on any particular portion of the scale? With statistics, the more tests that you run, the more likely you are to get a significant finding just because you're running enough tests that by chance one of them should be significant. Um, they did find that significance. So they found memantine to be more effective than placebo in the inhibition. So being able to inhibit some of um, those other distractors that may be problematic for patients. They also saw that it was a benefit in the self-monitoring, that patients had a better handle on um, what some of the things that may be interfering with their ability to, to take care of the tasks they needed to take care of. They also um, looked at the percent of patients who their original scores were relatively moderate to severe showing impairment, who then became normal at the end of the study. Um, so they weren't seeing as much of in interference by those symptoms at the end of the 12 weeks. And there were more categories where the memantine group showed that improvement um, in the total score in shifting. So their ability to um, change their attention um, and move from one thing to another. And then again, their self-monitoring. To be fair, they also found that placebo was better in the inhibition, which is interesting because we just said that that was improved with memantine. Um, so they found that there were more patients on placebo who went from having um, significant difficulty inhibiting outside um, stimulus from distracting them and then being having normal scores um, at the end of the 12 weeks. So are there differences? Yes, yes, there are between the two. However, it was not enough to demonstrate that there was a difference between both of these. And both groups, even the sugar pill group, uh, or it wasn't a sugar pill, it was just a placebo, even the non-active ingredient group showed improvement over time. So it really didn't demonstrate that there was a benefit for the memantine. So putting that together, um, Yes, the pilot trial did demonstrate that there was improvement. And while we did see improvement in the symptoms, um, and maybe the memantine had some improvement for inhibition and self-monitoring, overall, it really wasn't consistent. Um, so we don't have a lot of robust or strong data to support the fact that memantine would improve symptoms of ADHD, at least in adults at this time. So what does it look like for kids? Um, I, th I found this interesting. Um, this retrospective review included a lot of background information about why are we using them in teen in, in kids who might have um, different neurodevelopmental disabilities like autism spectrum and ADHD. So there was this huge write-up. And I was like, oh, great, this is gonna give us information. So retrospective chart review, it was done in Canada at a pediatric neurology clinic. They looked at over a one month time frame which of the kids were prescribed memantine and what were they using it for? There were only eight kids. Of those kids, only one had ADHD. Um, so I was like, oh, well, that wasn't nearly as exciting as I thought that it was going to be. They were saying that this showed improvement in ADHD symptoms, but the child was a nine-year-old male who also had autism spect spectrum disorder, was on methylphenidate and guanfacine, and the improvement that they saw um, through the chart review was improvement in interpersonal skills, language skills, as well as eye contact. Um, so I wasn't really convinced that this showed us that there was improvement in ADHD symptoms um, because those really could be more of the autism spectrum disorder symptoms. So that was not super helpful. Um, there was another pilot trial so yes, they are starting to use this in some of those patients. Let's look at what this actually looks like. So it was open label and they were trying to figure out which dose they were supposed to use. This was only eight weeks in duration. The patients were between six and 12 years old and they had to have a diagnosis of ADHD. They were split. Um, so some of them were in cohort one, which uh, titrated up to 10 milligrams. 
Some were in cohort two that could titrate up to 20 milligrams of memantine daily. Their primary outcome was the ADHD rating scale. Interestingly, uh, more than 85% of the patients in the 10 milligram group um, of memantine dropped out because they said they did not see improvement in the symptoms, the ADHD symptoms. A uh, little less than 40% dropped out for that same reason in the 20 milligram group. Um, so it appeared that that higher dose did seem to look like it was uh, more beneficial for them. When we look at the actual rating scores, um, so at baseline, they were all in the low to mid 40s. So they were moderate severity of um, ADHD symptoms. And then the change in that score from baseline, the 20 milligram group at four weeks had about an 11 and a half point decrease. Um, so that would have taken them more to mild symptoms. And that was pretty well sustained, even increasing a little bit to an average of 16.5 um, change from baseline. For the 10 milligram group, there was only about a three and a half point reduction um, from 44. So they really stayed more with the moderate severity of symptoms. And um, I believe only one of those patients made it to eight weeks. Um, and they did not include that data because it would have been identifiable for that, that individual. So maybe that higher dose could show improvement, but let's look at some other evidence. Based on the pilot study, they were looking at in a randomized double blind trial. So patients who got, um, in this case, they were given um, either methylphenidate or memantine. They wanted to see how this would compare um, in an active comparison, up to 20 milligrams of the memantine. And then they use kind of smaller doses, <clears throat> excuse me, of the methylphenidate. So only up to 30 milligrams. Their outcomes, <clears throat> excuse me again, grab a sip of water here, um, were again the ADHD rating scale. When they looked um, at from baseline to the end of the six weeks, they said there was a difference um, in the memantine group. I included the scores. So when they did the ADHD uh, rating scale, these are the baseline values. <clears throat> Um, so um, baseline values for inattention for both the memantine and the methylphenidate group, and then for hyperactivity, uh, impulsivity for memantine and for uh, methylphenidate. So the, the blue line is the baseline. It's kind of shifted on me a little bit, um, but there was no difference between them. At three weeks, there was some improvement. So the red line, um, there was some improvement in both groups at that three week time frame, both in inattention as well as in the hyperactivity impulsivity. The green line is the six week data. Um, so what we saw at the end of this, there wasn't a huge additional difference in those three weeks, but statistically there was a difference between the blue line and the green line. So both the uh, methylphenidate and the memantine groups had a reduction in symptoms overall. When they looked at them head to head, there was no statistical difference. Um, so the overall amount of difference between them, um, between the two groups was not noted to be different, although it was a small number of patients and they included these and I wanted to just point this out. Um, so the green line, so this is the ADHD symptom score. The green line is methylphenidate, um, which actually showed a much, greater numerical reduction than um, the memantine group, which is our blue line. So statistically, there wasn't a difference between the two. <clears throat> Clinically, you might be able to tell the difference between a child that has a score of about 22 um, and one who has a score of about 27. So 27 is more the mild to moderate, where 22 is starting to, to move us more toward those mild symptoms. Um, so statistically, not a difference. It was only six weeks. They did use kind of lower doses of the methylphenidate, um, <clears throat> but potentially there is a bigger difference because when they looked at the clinical global impression, um, the patients who are on the methylphenidate, so that green line, 
did look to be improved. The severity of their illness was reduced at that six week time frame, where it really was not as much reduced in the memantine group. So statistically, yes, we didn't see a difference, but likely there was a much bigger difference there. And if we had a bigger sample size, we might have been able to tease that apart. So again, improvement from baseline in symptoms, but how significant, it didn't look like it made a, a huge impact in the severity for these kids. So pilot study again said yes. Um, when we looked at something that was a little bit more standardized, the answer was no. Uh, we really didn't see a consistent difference between those. So Mementine, I guess the story is still to be determined. We're seeing inconsistent results. Um, so maybe a little bit of improvement is that clinically significant. We're using moderately ill patients. Um, would this really be helpful in sicker patients? They haven't really explored that yet. Um, on the adverse effects side, the, the medication was really well tolerated um, for both the adults and the children. So at least we're not uh, causing some damage on, on that side. But if we're adding benefit, I think uh, we don't have enough to say, yes, this really would be a, a robust treatment option at this point. So with that, I will stop my share.